So we'll go ahead and kick off the webinar. This is the evolution of air sealing. Um, we are, uh, we partnered with this with Owens Corning. And uh, I'll just go ahead and introduce myself here for those of you that are new to the RetroTech webinar series. My name is Sam Myers. I'm the uh, trainer and educator for RetroTech. <clears throat> um, I'm the ResNet certified HERS Raider. Um, if you go to any of the conferences and trade shows, you've probably seen me around there. Um, I have a lot of experience in the field doing all sorts of diagnostic tests on both residential and commercial buildings and uh, started out my career um, after grad school working for a company here in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I'm located called Advanced Energy, um, working with some of their building performance programs. And I have a special guest with me today with Owens Corning, Mr. Cody Wilson. Uh, Cody, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself here. Uh, sounds great. Thanks, Sam. Uh, my name is Cody Wilson. Um, I am a recovering HERS Raider for about 15 years. Um, been in the energy consulting business for over 17 years. Um, was in charge of about 27 HERS Raiders in California and Nevada. Uh, worked on various Building America programs on testing uh, new products coming into the market. I've uh, been uh, working with the uh, California Energy Commission on writing the energy codes for about 10 years in California. I've been with Owens Corning now for uh, five years, and I'm on the market development side and the sales side. So I work with the HERS Rating community, the builders, and what we do is we take a look at where the market is going, where the energy codes are going, and work with our building science team and research and development team in coming up with uh, cost-effective uh, solutions to help solve the builders' problems. And so... Um, our main focus in the last three years has been on air sealing, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Awesome, Cody. Well, thank you for joining us. Another thing to mention, uh, if you're a HERS Raider or if you're attending the ResNet conference this year, uh, Cody and I have teamed up to put on an event um, in New Orleans. There's the conferences in New Orleans, and so we have reserved uh, a spot for Monday night on Bourbon Street at Pat O'Brien's, and it's the Briar Suite. So uh, we'll provide food and drinks. Come by and hang out. Um, consider this your your invitation to come join us that Monday night at 7 p.m. Just be sure to send Cody an email to RSVP. So we have Cody's email here. It's Cody.Wilson at Owens Corning. Um, Cody, did I miss anything about this? Nope. I'll see you guys there. So with these webinars, uh, we tried to make this webinar series a good educational resource. And so I always like to start this off with some basic stuff about performance testing, and then we'll dive into uh, to our topic here. So I just like to bring up, you know, what, why do we do a blower door test and why do we care? Um, whether if it's for code or uh, whether if it's a builder just cares about their quality control or how well their houses are doing, or if you're a HERS Raider, um, blower door testing or duct testing is, is a large part of that as well. So really, it's just to comply to whatever standards, whether if it's municipal or state or for a third party program like Energy Star or some other program like that, or if the builder just wants to see how well they're doing. And I always like to start off with some blower door basics, too. So basically, you know, what is this thing we're hooking up into a doorway and how does it work? Um, what a blower door is used for is to measure and expose leakage in a building enclosure. And this is what our RetroTech blower door looks like. Uh, it's a frame and aluminum frame and canvas that's set up in an exterior doorway. We have our calibrated fan and our digital pressure gauge that creates uh, a desired pressure inside the enclosure and is able to measure it um, with the gauge. So for residential buildings, we either pressurize or depressurize to 50 pascals. Uh, here on this house, we are depressurizing to 50. And so these arrows are indicating air pathways. So this is air moving through the house and out the fan. And these darker blue arrows are our air leaking into the enclosure. Um, so you can see we'll have a negative 50 inside and positive 50 right at the edge. And then we'll have a red tube that goes to the outside, which is measuring our outdoor pressure. So again, we don't only measure leaks with the blower door, we can also expose them and see where they are with other tools with the blower door as well. So whether it's a thermal camera or a handheld smoke device, um, there's all sorts of things you can find out inside a building enclosure with a blower door. So <clears throat> along with that, 
Uh, this is a big deal for HVAC contractors as well. Now they know the conditions of the envelope. So if any of you are familiar with um, load calculation software, such as WriteSoft or Elite or CoolCout, a big part of that is infiltration. And through my experience, what I've seen is a lot of HVAC contractors do is they'll just kind of guess and say, well, I guess it's average, um, which a lot of times that can be wrong. So uh, if you have a blower door measurement or a target that you're trying to reach, you can accurately enter that part in as infiltration can be a large proponent of the load calc. It can be up to 20 percent sometimes or maybe even higher. And so now it's no longer a guessing game. You actually have a measurement to get that right. So if you've joined us on our previous webinars before, uh, we've touched on how to get a house tight, but we've only really dabbled on it, but we've never really gone into much detail. And so that's what I wanted to cover today. And so Cody is the perfect person to bring on board to talk about that with us. And so Cody's going to show us um, not really how to test houses. We've covered that on a bunch of webinars before, but Cody's going to show us how we get a house tight. So uh, Cody, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to you. Well, thanks, Sam. Thanks for inviting me to do this presentation. Um, I mentioned earlier that I did a lot of my first reading experience out in California and Nevada. Um, right now, I'm currently located in Texas. So uh, when the energy codes came and the northern part of the state went from five air changes in some areas of the state went from seven down to three, there was a panic on how they were going to do this. So uh, we worked with and looked at different air sealing techniques um, in different parts of the U.S. and outside of the U.S., and say, okay, well, how are they doing this? Uh, for example, in Canada, where their air change requirements are two air changes or less. So we looked and said, okay, well, what are they doing consistently and how are they getting consistent results? So we took a look at the way they were air sealing and said, okay, well, we build a little bit different here in the U.S., especially in different parts of the U.S. So how can we take that practice and make it applicable to the U.S. and then different parts of the – and different parts – um, of the way we build differently, basements, no basements, uh, two-story, tri-levels, um, in all those different types of applications. So um, what I'm going to cover today is um, one of the things is we're, we're trying to make these houses tighter, but at the end of the day, we're trying to sell um, our customers or our indirect customers are trying to sell these houses. So what are the benefits to the air sealing? Um, what are the common issues we come across with different air sealing type of solutions? Um, and then I'm going to go over a air sealing study that we've done where you get the best bang for your buck for air sealing. Then talk about cost of, um, I'm going to go over some cost effective air sealing measures that we've used in different parts of the U.S. That are, give, that are providing consistent results based upon the studies that we've done with Canada and our building science team. And then we're going to talk a little bit about a new uh, product or a new uh, technology called Aero Barrier. Um, this, 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 this product is going, is going to simplify the way we air seal moving forward. And we're going to talk a little bit about this and Owens Corning's partnership with this company and this technology. And then usually the, the, I get a lot of questions on, okay, we make the air tight, we make the house tight, it's ventilation, what are we doing with our ducts? Uh, what about the house as a system? So with Owens Corning, yes, we sell insulation products, but we look at the house as, as a, an entire system. And the core of that is first is not letting mother nature getting in and out of the house and controlling mother nature coming in and out of the house. But you also have to look at everything else. You gotta look at the HVAC sizing, ventilation, windows, um, all, all the other things that come into the play as a house as a system. So as we go into the air ceiling, we're, we're gonna show some examples and some case studies that we've done to kind of show different pathways. So there's not just one pathway that's going to work. There's different ways, to, depending on how you build or what part of the U.S. you're in. But this can give you kind of a, a holistic approach to say, okay, um, I don't want to do this, but I may want to do this, and trying to give you an idea of what we've done to help, one, make, make it – there's three things that I look at. One is, is the solution going to be – um, in, my in, in the builder's benefit when it comes to budget uh, construction cycles and things to that extent. Second, am I minimizing risk? What's my long-term, short-term risk that's involved with the solution? And three, at the end of the day, builders want to be able to sell homes. Can you sell the solution to the homeowner at the end of the day to that consumer? So 
whenever I'm looking at a solution, whether they're building one house or 1,500 homes a year, those are the three main areas or the categories that I look at when I'm trying to go for a solution. Cost effectiveness, um, long and short-term liability risk, and can it be sold to the consumer? So as we dig deep into this, you know, what are the benefits for reducing air leakage? And a lot of these, most of you already know, but we talk about savings on heating and cooling costs, um, and, um, enjoyable, more comfortable home. Comfort, to me, is one of the biggest areas. I don't focus as much on energy efficiency. I, I focus on comfort because if I'm making the house comfortable, the energy efficiency piece usually just falls into this. And we talk about everything that we do in a house, but a lot of times in, 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 in my previous life, there's energy efficient homes, but there's uncomfortable rooms in an energy efficient house. And I get calls constantly about, hey, this far bedroom is, you know, it, I'm, it's always hot, it's always cold, but yet I have an Energy Star home or I have this high performance home. One of the things that we take, you have to take into consideration is if you look at the four walls of that room that's being uncomfortable, usually there's two things that are stagnant or the same, and that is your R value in your wall does not change unless you didn't put it in properly, and the U value in the solar heat cane coefficients on those windows usually stay the same. Uh, depending on the type of windows, those could leak more than others, but the one part that's not, that's not a, a, a steady component of that room is the air leakage. So if you have unwanted air, hot and cold air coming into that room, no matter what you do to that room on the R value, it, it's hard to put a tangible um, piece of how do you make that room comfortable. So that's why air ceiling plays a really important part about comfort coming into the room. Same thing with um, if you're in a hot, humid climate or in a high, humid climate area. You know, one of the things that frustrates me in, in certain levels of the U.S. is that if you're in a mild climate zone, let's say Houston, Florida, um, those are considered mild climates, but they're hot, high, humid climates. And for you HERS Raiders on there, you know that if I take a house from five air changes down to three air changes in, let's say, Houston or Florida, you don't really get a good bang for your buck in the software. But in reality, you're taking a lot of humidity out of that out of that house, what means the house is working less to make that house comfortable. And so I think that you should get more credit for making a house tighter in a milder climate zone, but you don't get that. You get more credit for putting good dehumidification or a good ventilation system kind of helps with it as a system. But I mean, you still have to have a good ventilation strategy if you're making the house tight, but you don't get as much credit as I believe as you should in certain climate zones um, for making a house um, tight and then working your way out from, from the leakage of the homes. So, and then um, other benefits for builders is diminishing outside noise. Um, you have insects, um, pests. Um, in some areas of the U.S., we've, we've done a lot of interviews, and one of the other things that came in and we weren't expecting it interviewing with people is dusting. And that was a big one because, you know, I love my house. It's, I have no energy bills because it's a zero energy home, but I don't have to dust and maintain my house. So homeowners at the end of the day really don't understand air changes per hour, but that's not what you're trying to sell to a homeowner. You're really trying to sell what benefit does air sealing do to improve their lives because that's what they're doing when they're buying a home is trying to improve their, their, their life. So they don't understand ACH, but they do understand these things, low cost, less dusting, less insects, indoor air quality. All these things are emotional ties to buying a house and how it relates to their everyday life. So it's great. And then it, this is a little survey that we've done with builders on how does air sealing and a high performance wall system contribute to what's important to them. And you look at this list and we kind of went over this comfortable energy efficient, inexpensive to run and maintain, comfortable temperature year round, you know, insects. I mean, these are all the things based upon the responses we got that's important to their house. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is relevant to what we're looking here. And then the stuff that we don't see and is, is just as important. The homeowner doesn't see, they, they see the room on the left. They don't see the room on the right and how important 
managing your moisture strategy and your air, air strategy and the thermal loss that comes along with this, how important that is to the overall comfort of the home. So what are our challenges with air sealing? So we've been training contractors to through the year uh, through the last three years and you know these are the most ones that we come across um, I always say there's the saying there you know it takes a village to raise a house uh, to raise a child well it takes a village to air seal a house everybody is, in, in, is 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 responsible for air sealing a home so but that's also complicated too because we have labor issues we have a lot of different um, trades coming in and out you may have the same trade coming in one week that we've trained and got them ready and then a brand new trades coming in with the same company the next day. So you've got a lot of people coming in and out. So how do you send a consistent message and making sure that you, what we try to do is set a culture within the organization from the top down to show the importance of this. And you have tons of materials involved. You've got talks, you've got foam, you've got all these different things and you know you have an insulation contractor running around with a can of uh, can foam running around trying to plug up all these different holes. And they all work on piecework and they're running around trying to get the house as quickly as possible. So the, the hardest part is the human error element and trying to take that out of the equation. Um, most importantly, it's knowing where to air seal. Um, a lot of builders take a blanket approach to air seal, but if you hit the certain spots and where you need to air seal, you don't have to spend as much money as a, to a blanket approach to air sealing. And that's where the key component is, is getting the best bang for your buck. And at the end of the day, the hardest part is, is you don't know whether you've passed until, you've got, until you take a blower door test. And that's at the end of the, uh, end of the equation, and that's right before a homeowner's getting ready to, uh, to move in, you're trying to get your, your close of occupancy, and then your house is not passing. Now what do you do? And you know, the last thing you want to do is be tearing down walls and trying to figure out where it's going to go. So if you know where the air is not coming in, at earliest stage of construction, it's better to know that so you can pinpoint and figure out where the air is going to be leaking at the end of the stage so you can fix the issue if something gets missed. And the biggest thing in, in working with builders is the economics of this. You know, the average builder that I've worked with in Texas, they kind of put in a, they have a certain amount of budget that they know that they're gonna to have to get from five down to three air changes. And on average, they put somewhere between $1,000 to $2,000 of extra material, labor, and all these things that are going to come in, depending on the complexity of the house. They know that's being added to their budget to get to the level that they need to go. But there's still no guaranteed results. And that's where a lot of the challenges that we see out in the field. So this is a study that we've done. And this is a guideline. And the reason why I want to say this is a guideline, everybody knows or anybody who's related with air sealing knows that top plate to attic is our biggest is our biggest culprit. Um, but if you look at the bottom of that list, it says seal plate to foundation, right? And if you put seal seal in there, you're good. Well, in some cases, I've seen seal seal actually take, you know, depending on how well that wood is touching the foundation or in different applications in the U.S., I've seen that seal to sole plate foundation make as much as a one air change difference. In this study, it shows that it's, it's one of the least ones to look at. So you really have to look at the where your building practices, but a lot of these are all very common areas. Duck boots, top plates, recessed can lights. That's becoming less of an issue with LEDs and different types of cans that are coming into the market. So that's been helping in the industry. Rim and band joists, that's a big culprit. And you're talking garage to common wall is another area, and I'm going to go over and dig into the deep with that on the common areas that I see where we try to address these issues, but they usually, you end up falling short because of the type of application that you're doing. Window and door framing to sheathings, you've got exterior top plates, corners, you know, uh, bottom plate to subfloor, vertical sheathing joints, all these things come into play and this kind of gives you the best bang for your buck. Can you address all of them? Sure. Do you need to dress all of them? Not necessarily. Um, we all know with blower door testing, the smaller the house, the smaller the target CFM, so, and the less room for error. The larger the house, I think it's a catch-22, you get a higher CFM target, but you also have more areas you need to air seal. So it's just as crucial on a large house than it is on a small house to making sure that you're getting the areas where you're going to get the best bang for your buck. 
So what we've done in the past is we've been spending all this time air sealing from the inside of the house. And so what we learned from our friends in Canada is that if I air seal from the exterior of the house, then all of the little areas on the interior of the home become less relevant. And if I miss something on the interior of the home and all these little joints and I've air sealed from the exterior walls rather than from the interior walls and that gets missed, I still end up getting a pretty decent result. And so you have less junctions to deal from the exterior of the house from the interior of the house. So this next um, video right here that I'm gonna show you is, is, is a practice that we've used out here in Texas and in different parts of the US. And basically what you're doing is you're taking a gasket very similar to seal seal, but this gasket is actually air, designed to air seal. And what you're doing is you're taking this gasket and you're applying it on the exterior of the home. So all you're doing is picture framing the outside of the house. So no matter what cladding you put on the outside goes up against this gasket, now you've stopped all the air sealing. And this is this originated with us at the rim and band joist because builders are having a hard time air sealing from the exterior of the rim and band joist. And what we've done is just put a very inexpensive gasket in the important areas on the exterior of the house. And now we've stopped a lot of the air leakage that we're trying to air seal from the inside to the outside of the home. And once, and this is a, a very common practice in Canada, but they do it a little bit differently. So what we did is decided to, to, to apply this and start testing it in, in markets where air sealing is becoming important. So to give you an idea, I've got a builder, I got several builders that are building around 1,700 homes a year and using this practice on the exterior, and we'll talk about the interior in a minute, but they're averaging anywhere between two and two and a half air changes per hour. I also have custom home builders that are building million dollar homes, more complex, and they're still getting under three air changes per hour by addressing the air ceiling from the exterior from the interior. Um, these videos um, I have that you'll see, they will be available. So if you want to email me, you can do that. And, and I can send you these videos. These are training videos that no matter what trades are coming in, you, they can use on their phone. And they're also in English and in Spanish. So once the exterior is done, now we're looking at the interior, and this is the area that at the top plate that we look at mostly. And so looking on the interior of the home, we do this um, every single day. We talk about the interior. We're, we're putting gaskets. We're putting liquid-applied gaskets up at the top plate, um, and that's a very good practice to do, and we've seen this, but where, where we see is areas – where common mistakes at the top plate is being applied and putting the gasket like this in, in the right way and applying it the correct way. Um, as you saw in the, in the beginning, one of the most common areas, if you look at this room right here, the room to the right has a room above it, right? So you don't fit. And the most common area I see is that they're not putting the gasket on that exterior wall because there's condition area above it. And that is one of the most common mistakes I see when applying a, a gasket. That is still an exterior wall. That's a rim and band joist right there. So you still have to put that gasket up on the top plate on the exterior wall, even if there is living space above it. On the interior walls, you don't. The second most common area I see is, is the hot walls, knee walls, however you want to take it. So mostly we are only putting a gasket up on the top plate of a hot wall. What we do is we picture frame that hot wall and put a gasket around the whole entire area. So once the drywall comes up against that gasket, you, now you have a complete gasket. So whatever happens behind that wall. The biggest issue we have is on ceiling height changes like you're seeing here, there's usually no blocking. Same thing with bolted ceilings. You have to connect that top plate and there's got to be some place for the gasket to connect in order to get a full seal at the top plate. Usually the fire blocking goes up higher than what we normally see and it doesn't go down lower so where there's a place for the gasket to seal. And so that's a very common issue we see out in the air, out in the field when they're trying to put a top plate gasket in there and they, they're still having a hard time fail. I usually go walk the house and those are the two main areas I see at top plate gasketing where they've made an attempt 
but if they don't have backing where those gaskets are, now the, the insulation contractor, they're trained on where to put it. So they're going to put that gasket there, but you're, what you're going to do is you're going to see a gasket there and you're going to see nothing up against it, which is kind of defeating the purpose of putting it there. So that's part of the things that you want to work with your architect and your framers to make sure when you're pre-walking a house on a ceiling height change, to making sure there's a place where the gasket can go. And same thing with the vaulted ceiling. So some of the, you know, what we talk about with air, air and moving, um, moving with moisture in, in humid climates is by moving the vapor and the air sealing strategy from the outside, it's, it's a little bit easier to manage like we talk about. Um, putting continuous insulation in, in some cases on the outside of the house helps with the, your, your, your moisture strategy and your vapor strategy. Um, a lot of the times, um, I know like in Minnesota, they put a, a vapor retarder on the inside and on the outside of the house. They've been doing that for years and houses have been very tight in those areas. But now they're, now they're looking at continuous insulation. So if I put two inches or an inch of foam on the outside of that house, and we all know that it goes from hot to cold, well, now the vapor retarder on the inside is not needed because I'm slowing down that thermal bridge. And we'll get into that a little bit, uh, um, little bit later, but it just kind of gives you an idea that if you're stopping the air at that point and there's no air in that wall, and coming in and out of that wall at that point, it comes down to R value. R value is R value once you stop air into the wall. So where do you get the best bang for your buck by putting an R value in a wall? And we at Owens Corning at look at all various products and the highest R value in a wall other than closed cell spray foam is a blown in fiberglass wall. So for an example, in a two by six wall cavity, Open cell foam will give you about an R19. Cellulose will give you about the same. Closed cell will give you more, but with a fiberglass blown in wall, you can get up to an R24, and you get an R15 in a two by four wall cavity. But the problem is, is you have to stop that airflow in order to get the correct R value. Um, right now, I'm gonna, before we get into the aero barrier piece and the case studies, I'm gonna stop and open up for some questions right now yeah so let's see what we have <clears throat> we've got quite a few here hang on one sec let me get these pulled out just a few things um how do you get info for uh to us for bpi you can just put that information in the question box uh will cody's slides be available yeah we'll, we're actually recording this webinar and we will post it on uh retro Tech's youtube page and i'll have a link for that at the end uh, if you go to YouTube and just search Retro Tech Energy, we'll have it up there uh, within a couple of days. Yeah, and we have also, I mean, that little piece of this uh, air sealing study is just one section of the entire study. So if you really want to get geeked out and you want to get every, uh, the entire study, um, at the end, my email address and everything will be there, and you can feel free to contact me, and I can give you uh, several different air sealing studies to help you as a guide. And all same thing with the links of those animated videos. Great. Uh, we have another question here. Um, when will this measure be enforced in Texas for new construction? Um, what measure are we talking about? Uh, I would assume it would just be uh, air sealing in general to this to this tightness. Okay. So right now, anything north of Waco is three air changes. Anything south of Waco is five air changes. So um, and. The uniqueness about Texas, and it's really not that unique if you look at different parts of the United States, um, a lot of it depends on the billing department on whether they are enforcing the codes. Um, I can go to one jurisdiction and they enforce it. In some areas, they aren't enforcing it as much when you get out into the rural, er the rural areas of Texas. Um, I think the same thing goes. There's a state adopted code, <clears throat> and Texas has a state adoption, and so the building departments are responsible for enforcing that. And I know if there's any HERS readers out here in Texas um, on this call, they will tell you it goes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but the three air changes is a mandatory measure. Now they do have an alternative to three in North Texas that they can use, <clears throat> but no, it's no less than four air changes even with that alternative approach. Um, and then once we get into multifamily, that's also even more of a 
convoluted area as well because they made an amendment here that you can go to five, but that also is by jurisdiction to jurisdiction in getting to five air changes on a multifamily unit, which we all know is not the easiest thing to do. Great. So we have another one here. Um, is there anyone using uh, your air sealing products that you just showed uh, on existing homes? Um, no. And I would say that on an existing project, unless you're doing a full gut job and you're taking the cladding on the outside of the house off, that may not work. Um, <laughs> yet, um, if, if you're, that would work if you're doing a, a complete gut job. Um, if you're not doing a complete gut job, um, there's, you know, you're limited to what you can do to air seal on a retrofit, on a retrofit house. And that's a completely different class um, that we can talk about as far as air sealing on retrofit. Um, I'm putting together a class, matter of fact, I'm working with Sam on that because um, you have to be careful on how tight you make a house on an older home if you don't look at the HVAC and all the other things that go along with that house and making sure um, that if you're making that house tight, you may, on in some cases, do more harm than good. Um, especially if you have an old air conditioning unit that now is usually oversized already and now you're making a house tighter and now the system is con really undersized and it's complete and it's short cycling all the time. So it, it's a holistic approach, but there are certain areas in the house where you can go in and make the biggest bang for your buck around light sockets and things like that. Um, but Putting a gasket, like I said, unless it's a gut job, it's really not going to be the best um, solution for you on a retrofit. All right. Um, we haven't gotten into error barrier yet, but there was already a question about it. Uh, we just wanted, somebody wants to know if it's available in the UK and if not, when? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I can find out for you. Um, also, you can go to the uh, www.aerobarrier.com. And they will tell you where they have dealers and that are lo uh, closest to you. I do know that they are having discussions outside of the U.S. I do know that this is a common practice going on in Canada right now. Um, and I know that the owners of the company are been doing presentations and installing this in different parts of, 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 of other countries. Where, I don't know. But um, if you go to site they'll tell you where it's at where where there's a dealer close to you um another similar question yeah this is the air sealing concepts that cody has showed is mainly for new construction and there is like i said there there's that a separate class on retrofit on where to get the best bang for your buck on 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 an existing house Again, depending on what stage the house is in. Now, if you if you're gutting the job um, on the inside and you're re-insulating and putting new drywall on the home, you could do that same picture framing from the inside to help on the air sealing as well. Because if you can't get to the outside of the house, um, it really just depends on where you're at and in a retrofit job. Well, that kind of brings us to this next question. Um, somebody wants to know if you have any any videos similar to what you just showed or any other kind of resources for a uh, for existing houses? Um, no, not yet. We we have not really focused as much on the uh, on the retrofit side. I've been pushing it through our company because we know that it's becoming more and more popular, especially the way the housing market's going right now. It's not it's not crashing like it did in the past, but you know, you're having more homeowners are keeping their houses and doing a lot more retro work. I'm seeing even different parts in the U.S. where you have to, um, in order to sell your house, you have to go in and do upgrades to the house um, and bring it to a certain level before you can sell it. That's going on in California. That's going on in some parts of Texas. And I know there's other parts of the U.S. that are looking at it as well. So we do know on a retrofit side that that is becoming more and more of a popular way of going in and just keeping the house I have. So unfortunately, right now, we don't have any videos um, pertaining to that at this point. But we are working on them as well. We, we are working on it. Cool. Well, that's it for the list for now. Uh, Cody, you should still have control. Okay.
All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to dive into uh, Aero Barrier and in this te uh, um, and this technology. And so, you know, everything that we talked about up to this point, all of our challenges and everything um, to getting a house to a certain level. Uh, when I first saw this technology and started testing it and studying it with as Owens Corning has looked at it, um, the first thing I said, okay, well, this can't be that easy. And so there's some there's something that's got to be going on here to make it, I mean, you know, that, that sign of it's too good to be true, it must be. Um, we've done several applications with this with this system, and it, it's truly a very I, I, I believe it's going to change the way we air seal houses moving forward. Um, it's a, it takes the the human error out of the equation, and it's the only system in the market that will actually guarantee the level of air changes that you want to get. So let me see if I can go to the next. Make sure I got. There we go. So what is the what is the process? So basically what you're seeing here is we are now going back, you know, I talked about before how we were taking it and air sealing from the outside in because there was no real easy way to seal all the little joints and everything from the inside. Well, now we're taking it back to the inside of the house because because we found a way to make it easy to air seal from the inside. What you're seeing here is all the little areas that this this system is going to address. So I'm gonna go up one before we go into that previous slide. So here are your steps. Step one is you do your stage one poly seal like we've been doing for the last 30 years that we have for fire and safety. Then you go to insulate the house, you drywall and tape and mud. After that, the this, this system takes care of the rest. So what you're doing is we're hooking up these tripods throughout the house and then we hook up a blow, uh, it's, a, it's a modified blower door. It's not a traditional blower door that you normally see. And then what they do is they pressurize this house to about 100 pascals. And then they shoot this, a, it's a synthetic latex based product. So whenever we say latex, everybody's like, oh, my customers are, are allergic to latex. In some cases they are but not an acrylic base uh, latex, it's, it, it, it's a different type of product. It's very low to no VOC product, it's an acrylic based mist, it's about the same as, no different than if you were painting or any other type of uh, non-flammable, um, non-toxic type of solution. So what they do is they shoot this in into a mist, a very fine mist into the air. As the house is being pressurized, this mist is finding all the crevices that where air can come in and leak. And what it's doing is it's sealing everything in that house up to a half inch. Now, if you look over here on number five, you'll see this little report. So what the machine, it's all computerized. And so the computer is measuring first along, what's my baseline on my pressurization? And it's telling me, okay, my, my baseline right now is seven air changes. Well, I'm just gonna, just gonna throw out numbers. And so as the house gets tighter, when this acrylic, what it does is it hits the first spot and then the next piece of, uh, of mist goes to the next spot. And then what it does is it just collects until it fills up the hole. Now, as it's going in and as the house is getting tighter, the machine is putting less and less product into the air. So you tell me I want to be every single time at two air changes, it goes down to that number and then the computer shuts off. It, and, it, and it's it's basically it's basically that simple. So it gets to the level that you want to get to, and it tells it that it's done. It takes all the human error element out of the equation, and then it gets to the level and shuts off. Now, if you look over here in in the picture number four, it shows you those gaps and how it's filling in those gaps. You won't necessarily see those gaps because sometimes it's going in behind those holes and sealing it to the very first point of contact. So when I've walked several houses, it looks like the house was never air sealed. So what we've done, let me see if I can find it. So this is a video. So that square kind of is the equivalent, let's say if you took all the different little holes to about one air change. And what we do is we put a screen around that hole and then right now the, the um, that mist is actually shooting up inside the house and finding all the holes 
So it's going to go to the, the first pass of the resistance and it's going to find that hole and seal it. And as you can see in this video, it is quickly filling up that area. And that's what it's doing to all the little areas inside the house and getting it to the level that you want to get it to. So it, it's sealing it up. It's, and this is going at all of the areas where air can leak. So, and as you can see here, within a matter of, I would say, I think we have another 30 seconds um, on this video, this whole area will be completely sealed up. So what we do is we put this hole in here um, on all of our tests, and then we take the screen and leave it for the home, for the builder and for the HERS rater. So because if they go and look at the house and they'll see areas where it's not air sealed, they'll know that this has been sealed. And then we'll also print out that report to make sure that they get the test results to know where it's going to be. Now, I know the HERS raters out there are thinking the same thing I'm doing when I saw this. So this is a pressurization test. We do depressurization. And the reason why we're doing uh, pressurization here is to find the holes. We do depressurization so all the dampers um, are closed at the normal state and the house is under normal living conditions. That's one of the main reasons why we do a depressurization on a blower door test. So we took these results and then went and turned around and did a depressurization. We did see a little bit different in the numbers, and the only reason why you're going to see that is, one, is we tape around the windows because we all know windows leak, right? So um, if the windows are leaking, it's going to show up on that test. So we want to make sure we tape around the window um, to make sure that this um, sealant doesn't get on the windows. Um, the second thing, too, is, is that this sealant will not stick to anything vertically, so it doesn't stick on the walls. Uh, we, it will leave a little bit of a residue on the concrete. will not affect the flooring, um, but it will, you, you will have to do a little bit of preparation. So we do put some, uh, uh, like, an adjustable piece of foam inside the ducts to make sure it doesn't go into the coils of the HVAC. So there is some prep involved, but as far as worrying about this getting all over your walls, it's not going to get on the walls. That was what the cool part about it is. So once it gets to that pressurization level it needs to get to, basically what they'll do is they'll lift up the window, let it, uh, and then um, if, it's, if, if you have a good ventilation, it will ventilate right out the window. And then within 10 minutes, 15 minutes tops, you can walk back into the house. So the next common question that I normally get is, all right, well, if I'm letting this up into the atmosphere, is it safe? So um, as Owens Corning, we did um, testing on the product to make sure that it passes all the EPA um, verifications of going into an atmosphere and it's passed all the tests with flying colors. Um, we've also done longevity testing on this product and we've done to make sure that one is if it's going to seal is it going to stay sealed for long periods of time we've done 50 year testing on it we've tested as hot as 180 degrees and as low as minus 30 for long periods of time and we also the really nice thing about it as your the, the joints that it's connecting to is expanding and contracting this is going to make it, it this is flexible to enough where it's not going to crack the caulking like we see on most caulks. It's going to stay flexible for the life of the house and it's going to stay sealed for, for the life of the house. So those were some important things that we wanted to make sure. We also wanted to make sure that it was safe for our installers to install. They do, just like anything else when you're spraying something inside of a home, like whether it's paint or texture, we do want them to wear a respirator mask, but once it, it, um, the stuff is out, contractors can come in and come and can come out. So you're you're talking about maybe about an hour, maybe an hour and a half tops, depending on how tight you want to get the house and how big the house is, um, of actually air sealing time. You got about a, an hour or so for prep and an hour or so for teardown. But during the prep and teardown, trades can walk in and out, so it's not going to disrupt, um, disrupt the trades. Also, too, um, your, where the best part of the application or where the ideally is, is right before texture. So right after tape and mud, they come in here and they will use this. Now this product, this technology is new, but in the, the company itself is not. 
some of you may have heard about AeroSeal. AeroSeal is for sealing air ducts. So the company uh, AeroSeal was bought by, uh, I think it was Carrier, and Carrier um, had that technology for a while, and then when the housing market went to a downturn, um, they said that you know they wanted they sold the company um, this technology uh, to someone that actually worked at the uh, for Carrier, and then they went and um, expanded it on their own, and they said, well, if we can do this for ducks, why can't we do it on the house? And so that's where they came in and started um, advancing this technology moving forward. The one thing that, or the one area that's impressive to me, if you look over here on the right, um, and that number has increased, but if you look at single family, multifamily, floor door testing and, and applications, over a thousand applications and no one's ever failed a blower door test. One of the things that, really stuck to me is they didn't care how we built the house, what type of framing we did to the home. The only thing they asked me, can I pressurize the house? Yes. Okay. I can air seal it. And that's all they care about. And that kind of makes it simplistic. Um, and then we talk about the human error element out of the equation. So you have to have a certain amount of temperature and humidity level within the house. So, it's monitoring humidity and it's monitoring temperature as it's coming in. If those temperatures are not right, those, the sheen will not kick on the acrylic mist. And I mentioned that this was an, a, 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 uh, a, a different type of blower door. So this blower door can actually bring heat in to try to get humidity levels down and also at certain air temperature levels as well. So it, it, will monitor to make sure it's in the best working conditions before it's applied. Um, we all know that no matter what product you're putting in, you're only as good as your installer. So this kind of makes it as, you know, uh, it takes the human error element out of the equation and won't allow you to screw it up. And that's the part that's impressed me. And I've done applications um, with this in certain areas where the humidity levels were very high and we had to wait for it to dehumidify or get the humidity levels down to where it needed to be, and then the machine kicked on and did the air sealing. So that's one of the nice things about it. It's you know it, it's all computer generated. So once you're done with the prep, the computer takes over and makes sure it's done right and it's done right the first time. So looking at this, and and we talked briefly about multifamily and how hard it is to get multifamily units to a certain air change level, no different than, you know, I mean, you're talking about, you know, common walls and on, in the areas where it's hard to even get multifamily units down to five and the, the planning that comes along with this. We've been looking and doing multifamily. This is a project that we did in New York where their average air changes were around nine and now they're right down to about one ACH 50 on every single unit. So we talk about, and there's, we talk about some of the benefits of air sealing in residential construction, but you, you know, we talk about noise and smell and all those other things. Those are magnified when you're living that close to your neighbor. So uh, we've seen applications in emergency rooms and things like that where, um, you know, you have to completely compartmentalize the rooms. So. Um, Looking at this in the multifamily unit where you have a 900 square foot unit and trying to get that house to under five or that unit to under three, this kind of this solves that problem for you. We already looked at the video. I think we already uh, addressed all of this on the installers. Um, this is an installer in Texas. Um, we already talked about the, uh, the changing of your schedule. If it's safe, we already went through all those. Um, some of the builder benefits. Um, one of the benefits that I've been seeing with this system, and Sam kind of touched it on before, is on your HVAC design. So usually when you're designing an HVAC system, there's a buffer in there because you don't know whether that unit's going to be at two air changes, two and a half air changes, or three air changes. So if you know you're going to be at that tightness level every single time, this helps you with your HVAC sizing and it also helps you with your ventilation strategy. 
and you don't have to worry about having that buffer every single time wondering if I'm going to be anywhere between three or three and a half or whatever it may be. I know that I'm going to be within two or two and a half air changes no matter what and, and having that consistent result helps you every single time on the HVAC design. Um, we're kind of running out of time, so I'm not going to go too much into this, but this is one of the things that are becoming more and more popular with us in Texas and different parts of the U.S. is buried ducts. Um, this is just another way of keeping, um, if, you're, if you're looking to put ducts in conditioned space or you want a ventilated attic because of humidity issues, this is a, a possible solution. What we've been seeing, I'm not going to get into this um, into too deep, but basically what this is telling you is what you're looking at here is the level, the first line is your level of roof deck. Your green line is the, the, the level of the temperature of the duct and the sensor right above it. So what we've been seeing with buried ducts is that on a 120 degree day when the attic is about 135 degrees, the air coming out of the air handler is at 55 and the air going into the room is at 57. We're only seeing a two degree gain from, from one end to the other, which means, and that's the whole point of getting your ducts in conditioned space is the system doesn't have to work as hard to distribute the cold air into the room. The concept that we look at is if you decrease the demand of the, where, of the area where the homeowner lives, and then also make it easy for the air to get from point A to point B is the same kind of solution that you would as if you're putting your ducts in condition space. Out here in Texas, you can park cars in our attics. Um, in some, uh, other parts of the U.S., you can barely walk in attics. So each different solution is going to be um, different depending on where you're at in the U.S. Some parts of the U.S., you've got basements. You're, you're very lucky. <laughs> in some parts of the U.S., we don't have that luxury. So we're looking at different ways to make the system itself efficient, minimize the risk, and just get to the point that we want to make sure that the air is getting from point A to point B and is not working hard to do that. And that's where the combination of that with continuous insulation, slowing down thermal bridging, you're looking at a house on the left that has continuous insulation on the outside and the house on the right. So when we talk about our value, so we just bought looked at 15 different slides and talked in all these different slides about getting the air out. Now that the air is out, how do we make the room more comfortable? So if you have an R13 or an R15 wall and you don't have continuous insulation, 22% of your house is made of wood. So and has the R value of equivalent to about one. So if you take that entire wall assembly and you say that R13, you take 22% off that, now you're about you're, you're, you're losing that total R value. So you're about an R10. So, and that's if the insulation that you're putting in there is installed correctly. That can also decrease your, the R value. But if you put a continuous insulation on the outside, not only are you slowing down the vapor going through there, you're also slowing down the heat transfer. So you're getting a higher R value by doing that. Now you stopped all the unwanted air coming into the house now you've decreased demand in the room that the, home, the, the people are living in are more comfortable. A lot of big things that are going to come into play also is glazing of the windows. I have houses that I've worked with that overlook a lake and it's 80% glazing on the back window. Not much you can do there, <laughs> unfortunately. I mean, but you can still try to make sure that the room itself is comfortable on all the other areas that you can control. So, this is an example of what we worked with with a builder. And this is a builder right now that is doing buried ducts. He's doing um, aero barrier and he's doing an R15 wall, R16 with a blown in wall system. Now he likes this system. This is his base comparison. He still has homeowners that come in and says, I still want to do spray foam in my walls in my attic. I'm like, okay. Well, that's going to be an upgrade because what we're seeing here, this is actually cheaper than what he was doing. But if you look at the diamond path number two on the bottom, here is his spray foamed attic in the same exact area versus doing the buried ducts. And as you can see, it's like you're going to spend an extra more money doing that. But if you look at the performance level, we're actually outperforming what you're asking for. 
Now, if you want to take that $5,000 upgrade and put continuous insulation on the outside, now you have platinum path number one. Now you look at his HER score, and there is where your return on investment is going to be. So it gives you a, an idea of him being able to say, if you still want this pathway, you can have it. It's going to cost you more money, but is it really going to give you the best benefit at the end of the day just because it's something that you want to, you want to use? And so we give these builders different ways to show this is how much money you're going to save, this is the money you're going to spend, and what's your return on investment based upon that. There's another builder that's in Texas that we worked with was Ron Davis Homes. He was doing two-by-four walls. He was putting his ducts in condition space, R13, R22 under the roof deck, three air changes, and as you can see, everything in here. That was his HER score. All we did with him is we went from two-by-four to two-by-six, filled up the cavity with an R24. We put a half inch of foam on the outside. Everything else stayed the same. The ducts were not in condition space. He was at an R49 lid. We increased his HVAC a little bit, but everything else stayed about the same, and we dropped his HER score to a 50, and it wasn't costing him any more to go this option than it was to go to this option. It was a little bit more, but if you look at the HERS points, he's dropped his HER score about 15 points, and all he did was just change the way he framed the house to get a higher R value in that, in, in that wall, making the house more comfortable. This is another builder that we worked with in Kentucky. His, and he was building an area. He does about 30 to 50 homes a year. He noticed that Energy Star was catching up the code, so he was trying to figure out a different way of doing it. Here's a little bit of cost of what he'd done. So he was at a HER 70. He was using R5 slab insulation. No continuous insulation, R38 blown attics, conventional water heater, efficacy lights, windows, 14 sear. So we worked with him. We put um, about R7.5 in the exterior on the house. Um, he did some accessories, increased his uh, raised heel trusses. Those were all increased, um, increased costs. What we he did do is he took out the R5 slab edge, um, and because he did the continuous insulation, um, with our tape and our flashing, he did not have to use the Tyvek. Now that that's that's a conversation. You can still uh, you can still use Tyvek without using our continuous insulation and our tape. But it's kind of like having belt and suspenders. You can go either way with this. We guarantee a weather barrier for the life of the house with our tape and our joints. So he was able to take those costs off. So you look at the labor, the materials, and then he filed for a federal tax credit. He's he actually went from a blower door test to a 4.9 ACH where he was at five, and he dropped his HER score from a 70 to a 49, and his, his cost increase uh, was around $5,000. This is the path that he took in Kentucky. So like I was saying, there's different ways, there's different paths that you can go to, and there's different ways of what you're gonna do. One thing that we do know is that the energy codes and the building codes are not going backwards. So they're all moving forward. So it's not a matter of if you may going to be doing some of these stuff. It's a matter of when. And what we try to do is take a look at that five, two-year, five-year, ten-year plan to say where are you going to go, what is the next solution, how are you going to get there, and what does that pathway look like. And if you look in certain parts of the U.S., let's just take ERVs and HRVs uh, as an example. I mean, when those were first into the market, those systems were anywhere from twenty-five to three thousand dollars when if you first wanted one. Now you can probably get a halfway decent ERV for around a thousand dollars or less. So as the supply meets the demand, the cost of the labors go down. So if you look at your plan now, that may cost more up front, but as as the market catches with you, you'll see that the cost of material and the contractors become more familiar with the practices. It doesn't become as as, as expensive. So it's just trying to figure out which way you're going to pick that path, how you're going to go that path. And if you're a builder on this call, rely on your HERS Raider to help you along that pathway. And because they see all this technology and they're the ones that are going to be able to validate it for you and look at, for you, look at it for you in the software, they're a great resource for you to have. Um, and I'm not saying that because I'm a former HERS Raider. I'm saying that because um, they – are your expert. They're the one that's going to help you, guide you along this pathway. Us at Owens Corning, we want to help you along that pathway as well, and that's what Owens Corning has hired me in different parts of 
people like me throughout the U.S. to help you along that journey. With that, uh, we'll open it up to some more questions. Here is my contact information. So if there's additional things that you would like that was not in the presentation where I have more detailed stuff, I'm more than gladly to get you that information. Awesome, thank you, Cody. I'm just gonna run through the question box here. Okay. So we've got quite a few. <laughs> If we can't get to all of them, Sam, uh, please email me them and I'll sure. respond to them. Sure, we can reach out, but I think we've got a few here. We can go through it. Um, okay. Do you happen to know the cost of the air barrier equipment and the application cost? Um, I, I don't want to get into price because depending on where you are in the U.S., it's going to be different. Um, but if you... You know, you can contact your local aero barrier installer, and they will get and they will get you pricing. Um, if you want to get pricing on rigs, um, I would suggest going to the aero barrier website, getting in contact with an, the, the aero barrier company, and they can get and they can go with pricing for you. I, I can't. I really don't like to get into the pricing because it varies in different parts of the U.S. It also varies on how tight you want the home. So. Um, I, my suggestion is, is to talk, is to contact an aero barrier rep and have them give you pricing based upon your market. But I will say it's not as bad as you may think. This sounds expensive, but it's not as bad as as you may think in the markets that I'm in right now. Cool. And it's and it's great to see it get more mainstream too. I mean, it was it was featured on an episode of This Old House not too long ago, so it's it's yeah. moving along. And you'll see some more coming up with HGTV as well. Cool. And if you are going to IBS, we are going to be doing, if you're if going to IBS this year, we do have a booth. And we will be doing some more in, in trainings on this. And also the Aero Barrier and a lot of our other products were installed on the Next Generation house as well. So if you do go to the Next Gen house at IBS, you will see these solutions and products inside um, the Next Gen house out in Las Vegas. Cool. Somebody asked, uh, at what stage of construction is air barrier applied? Um, right before, te um, right before texture, right after tape and mud of the drywall. Now, I will say that there are builders that are still doing spray foam and this, and they will do it at the rough stage. So that is that is a possibility. There is a, bi a builder out in Prescott, Arizona. And he spray foam in his house, and then after he spray foams the house, he's using this to get all the other joints and seals on the exterior of the wall. Um, it's, you know, you can do that. It's probably not the most cost-effective approach. Um, you can do this at the rough stage if you wanted to. So if you're going for, like, passive house numbers, um, we have seen builders make put a lid on the, uh, on the ceiling and then put drywall at the garage common wall but left the walls bare and went to air seal that route. So if you're building, you know, five, ten homes a year and you want to get to do that, you can. Um, if you're in more of a production state, and you, I mean, uh, in most of the cases that I've seen, trying to get a drywaller to show up when they're supposed to is a challenge on its own. So disrupting that construction cycle makes it a little bit harder. So... There are different ways of doing it, but the most common and easiest way is stage one poly seal, insulate, drywall, tape and mud, and then have this installed. Well, somebody asked uh, to explain a little bit more of the extent of the prep that needs to be done. So you mentioned windows, but do you also need to do all planned openings such as exhaust fans and ERV penetrations? Correct. So the... Um, yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons why it's a little bit different test from pressurization and depressurization. So your exhaust fans are all taped up, um, your your ERV, your ducts. Now, when we get, when we go to the ducts, we're going inside the duct because we still want to seal that can to the drywall, which, you know, um, back in the day used to be the chicken and the egg. Who was going to do it? Well, this will solve it for you. Also, your recessed can lights. But it's mostly your windows, your dampers. Um, and, and around the edge where the connection of the window is, because if air can get through it, it's going to find it. And it's going to try to seal it. Gotcha. 
And somebody asked about cleanup at the end of Aero Barrier. Um, is there any excess material you have to clean up? No, you, like I said, you, they'll, they, they will do, if there's any additional cleanup, the crew actually comes in and do it. Um, you, like I said, you will feel like a little bit of like a residue on the concrete. So unless you're going to, if you're going to stain the concrete on a home, you're going to want, you're usually protecting that anyways from other crews coming in. Um, but other than that, I mean, it, it's, it's about the same prep and cleanup as you would as if you were painting and texturing a house. So, um, after a while, I mean, it doesn't do any, it hasn't made, it doesn't do any effective. If you're putting any type of flooring on there. That residue is not going to affect um, the glue that you're putting on if you're doing hardwood floors or you're doing tile or carpet. Gotcha. Um, and another air barrier question. Um, so if ducts are not in condition space, do the boots have to be sealed from the air barrier? Let's see. I uh, basically want to know what the effect air barrier has on the ducts. Um, the ducts itself, nothing, because we're putting a adjustable piece of foam inside the can so the product doesn't get into the duct system. Now, if you want to seal the ducts and do the aero barrier, they do have the aero seal machine, and you would have to check and see if they had a, a person that has both to air seal the inside of the house, uh, inside of the duct. But as far as the aero barrier by itself, that piece is being sealed off so it doesn't get inside the ducts. So we don't want it getting in the ducts and up and through the coil. Gotcha. But it will seal the cans to the drywall, which is another big issue you have with duct leakage. That's cans to the drywall is a double whammy. That's blower door and duct leakage, and this will seal that for you. And you covered this a little bit earlier, but what is the expected lifespan of air barrier? So we've done extensive uh, longevity testing on this product, and um, it's ASTM something. I, I don't know the number that goes behind it. All these different tests have, like, these long numbers behind them. But um, for, for longevity, we've done for 50-plus year testing on the product. Uh, like I said, we, we, we put it in at 30 to 30 below and then um, increase it up to 180 degrees um, in heat um, over long periods of time to age the product to where it would be if it was 50 degrees, and then also doing pressurization testing um, as well to make sure that it's not going to crack and everything, and it's passed every ASTM test that we we, we, we brought it through. So it should last for the, as, as long as the house is. It, what's nice, what, what's really impressive about the sealant is the sealant is a more aggressive, it's, it's not like normal caulking, like if you're doing, uh, you and I have seen in many times where they caulk the cans to the drywall and then by the time you get to the, the blower door test, that caulk is cracked because of the outside conditions. This product won't do that. Can you use, uh, can you use air barrier on existing homes? <laughs> That's the most common question I get. And the answer is, it depends. <laughs> uh, if you're doing a full gut job and you're going back to drywall and you have no flooring, easily. Um, they've done, I mean, on old historic homes, there was a house we did in Chicago that was at 17 air changes, and we brought it down to four. But if you do have, um, and I get calls, I've gotten six calls in the last two weeks on houses that we're not passing and getting ready to homeowner to move in, and they ask if we can come in there and do it. You can get this done while the house is painted. Um, we don't normally recommend it, but the amount of prep that it would take to get the house ready on a finished home, um, is, it's not very cost effective to have it done. Um, I will say that we are look and now that we've partnered with this technology and um this is a we don't own this technology this is a, a separate company we with us with owens corning the reason why we partnered with these people is because um we have a good insulating product the technology of fiberglass has is has changed throughout the years it's not your grandfather's fiberglass insulation it's made with 60 percent recycled material um it's it's not itchy anymore uh, we kind of look at it as like cell phones. So the technology of our product has increased throughout the years. 
the biggest problem was is that we didn't have an easy way to air seal a house. And so, um, because our product is not an air barrier, this product comes in there and does that. And so, um, with our product, with air barrier, we'll give you the highest performing house at the lowest cost. Um, but, um, and I say that because we are partnering with them to look at their technology and how to advance it to where this product could be a little bit easier on the existing housing side, on the retrofit side. Right now, it's not there, but we are working with them to advance it. And if we get to that point, we'll have another webinar. <laughs> gotcha. Um, last one, and I guess this is for me. Will RetroTech be offering an air sealing webinar for retrofitting existing homes? You've given me something to think about, and that's absolutely something I can do. So uh, keep your keep your ears open for that. Um, if you haven't uh, if you haven't signed up for our mailing list, do so. We don't send out a whole lot of stuff. It's usually just uh, when we have these kinds of webinars coming up and different events. So go ahead and sign up for that, so you can um, see when we have our next webinar coming out. We try to do one once a month, but it doesn't always work out that way. But uh, Cody, thank you uh, very much for coming on and spending your time with us and sharing what you have. Uh, this has been great. Um, I think you've, you've shared a lot and helped a lot of people out here that have been attending with us. Um, you've, got, you've got Cody's information there, um, cody.wilson at owenscorning.com. Um, feel free to give him a call. And all of our webinars are recorded. Uh, we have all kinds of stuff on our YouTube channel. Um, so it's go to YouTube, search Retro Tech Energy, all types of home performance, building performance, uh, building science topics covered there, videos from the field, webinars, you name it. Um, and if you have questions for me, feel free to shoot me an email. It's just sam at retrotech.com. Um, Cody, any, any last any last remarks? Uh, no, thanks for having me. And again, you guys have my email. Um, shoot me an email if you have any additional questions that we didn't get to in the presentation. Um, if there's other studies, I have several air sealing studies that I can give to you, those animated videos. The ones that you saw were just exterior and interior. We have one that does garage common walls. We have good flashing products, um, uh, practices as well. And again, those are in English and in Spanish. So if you'd like those videos, I can send those over to you as well. Excellent. And if you're going to ResNet this year, stop by and see us. We'll, we'll both have a booth. And again, we are putting on an event. If you uh, missed it at the beginning, um, send Cody an email. We're having a uh, after hours event on Monday night at ResNet uh, on Bourbon Street. So uh, if you're interested, uh, shoot Cody an email. and. Um, that wraps it up. So um, feel free to, to reach out to us if we didn't cover anything that you have questions on and uh, hope to have you on the next webinar. Thanks. Thank you.